If you would, take your Bibles with me and turn to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. We're going to pick up our, our study in the book of Romans in chapter 9 and verse 13. Rescue and mercy. Those two things go together, don't they? We're going to talk about mercy this morning. So it was, it's, it's cool for me to, to be able to come up after a song like that and just get to my mind focused on the fact that, that God rescues. God is merciful. God is also just. And to really understand his mercy, you, you must understand justice. And this subject is, is hard. Uh, there, there is no joke. Romans 9 is, is difficult. And we're not going to pretend to have all of the answers. We're going to talk about what we know this morning. And if you would, just stand with me as we honor the reading of Scripture together. And I'm just going to pick up in, in verse... Yeah. Let's just start at the beginning. Get the context here. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are the Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though God's word has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise that are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah has conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, although they were not yet born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on who I have mercy. And I will have compassion on who I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all of the earth. So then, he has mercy on whoever he, has, whoever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. And as we approach a, a text that is, that is difficult, but there are, there are statements here that did just seem to, to, to catch our, our attention. Lord, I pray that we would see Paul's thought, his argument. Lord, I pray that we would come to this text humbly, acknowledging that you are bigger and more grand. You are transcendent and we cannot comprehend You unless You reveal Yourself to us. Lord, and as we 
humbly look at what You've revealed to us this morning. Lord, I pray that Your Spirit would work in such a way that would, that would guide us to truth. That as we look at justice and, and mercy and how they, they fit together, Lord, I pray that You would give us ears to, to hear and a mind that, that comprehends truth. We might leave this place exulting in the glories of the Gospel this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. This last Tuesday, we had a, a deacon's meeting. And the deacon's meeting was, was in town, which is a little bit different. So I, I, I got my truck and I was backing out of the, the garage. And as I was backing out, I noticed that in our tree strip, there was a, a large skunk that was there and he was eating some of the, the food that Desiree had taken out to the, the tree strip, you know, the, the ucky food for the, the cats and apparently the skunks. And I got thinking to myself, I, I wish I had a gun. And then it dawned on me, I, I did have a gun. I had a, a 380, not the weapon of choice in that situation. But I drove my truck kind of out in the, the yard and got fairly close to it. I got my, my gun out and, and I put an earplug in my ear and the trunk, did, the skunk didn't even know I was there and I shot at it and it just doubled over like it was dead. And I started thinking to myself, I am a good shot. <laughs> and then I started thinking, well, what am I going to do with this thing? Then it started to move. So I shot again. And it stayed still for a second again. And then I was just going to drive off. And then it got up and it started to shake itself off a little bit. And instead of running into the trees that you would think it would do, it started running right toward me. And I didn't know what to do. It's running right toward the, the front of my truck. And I, and I had this split second to, to choose. I mean, the thing is spraying all over. So I roll my window up as fast as I can. And... I just, I just had thought I had hit this thing and now I'm unsure. And there was this moment of pride where I, I didn't want it to get away. So I had this choice. Do I try to run over it? Or do I just back up and let it go? And I would say nine times out of ten I would have done the right thing. But in, in this instance, I went to run over it. I'm pretty sure I knew it was really dumb, but I, I did it anyway. And I uh, just didn't want to let that skunk get away. It all happened so fast. Needless to say, uh, that happened Tuesday. My truck still stinks. But I think that story illustrates life. We all know good and bad, right and wrong. Yet we, we trust our hearts, and in the heat of the moment, sometimes what is wrong seems right. And before we even had time to, to process the situation, we've, we've trusted in our own heart, we've trusted in the, the corruptness, the wickedness that exists in our own hearts, and even the, the things that we think are, are good in the moment are, are not. And the trust that we've placed in our own self has proven once again to be in error. Why do we continually do that? We continually rely on ourselves when the Bible is clear that our, our hearts are, are desperately wicked and they should not be trusted. That our own righteousness is, is a, a filthy rag. You know, in the scheme of things, the skunk scent is going to wear off my truck. But the fact is, my own righteousness will never be good enough to win approval before God. On my own, in my own power, I will continually mess things up. I would mess up my own salvation if given the chance. Last time, we made the case that God was the only hero in our story of redemption. In our salvation, our redemption is solely 
by the grace and mercy of God and has nothing to do with our own goodness and our own merit because that is how it has to be. Because once we get the reins, once we get to choose, once we get to that in the heat of the moment situation that you got it or you don't, we're going to steer it off course and we're going to mess it up. God has to be the only hero in our story of salvation. So Paul, in in Romans 9, so far, has been making the case that God's word has not failed. God gave Israel promises, and he promised them that them would be the Messiah that would put an end to to the, the curse of sin and death forever. But Israel, by and large, has rejected the Messiah. And in their unrepentant state, they will die under the curse And this has caused some to think that God's word to his nation has failed. If Israel will not be saved, but Gentiles will, then how are we to trust what God says? To answer this, Paul says that not all Israel is true Israel. Not all who are children of Abraham are children of, not all who are children of Abraham, who are children of the flesh, are actually Abraham's children. In other words, what makes a child of promise is not being Abraham's physical offspring, but God himself. God's election of his his special favor to some, his special favor on Abraham and not others from Ur. On Isaac, but not Ishmael. On Jacob, but not Esau. This is what we looked at last time. And then it also brings us to verse 13. Verse 13 says, As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Quote from Malachi chapter 1. Might help just to read that section. Malachi chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. The Lord's love for Israel. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have, I, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country. And the people with whom the Lord is angry forever, your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. Notice the point of the text there is on the love that God has for Israel. And I'm not sure, though, that if the context there in Malachi makes the quote in Romans 9.13 easier. But I I think what makes that quote so difficult for us is the word hated there and not the word loved. For some reason, our sense of justice is, is peaked when we hear that God hated Esau. But we scarcely uh, question how God could have loved Jacob. I would suggest at the onset that for God to to love any of us is scandalous in light of what Paul has already said in the early chapters of Romans. We are told that humanity clearly perceived the eternal powers, the divine nature of God in the creation of the world, and that and that humanity did not honor God, and they exchanged the, the glory of the immortal God for, for images of, of creation in order. In other words, We have exchanged the worship of God who was not created for created images and things of creatures. And we've worshipped the creature rather than the creator. And in this, we are told that humanity was not only full of all sorts of sinfulness, but they were haters of God and inventors of evil. I was reading 
recently someone that suggested that there was a, a reason for people not living as long after the flood in the Old Testament or thereabout. And the reason that he gave that, that people didn't live as long was that it was actually God doing that and it was an act of common grace grace that God gave to to all of humanity. And it was an interesting thought that God in His his wisdom and grace decreed that that humans would not live that long. They wouldn't live like a thousand years. They would only live a hundred years. Can you imagine if people were allowed to live like a thousand years and devised and perfected evil over that whole lifespan? I mean, living one century curbs some of that but it's hard to imagine what people could devise and come up with over that kind of lifespan. We, we don't know the, the mind of God here, but yes, I can see this as an act of common grace. Certainly the world isn't as bad as it, it could be, but it, it's still pretty bad. There, there are evil people. And the fact is, if we were, the fact is that we are classified in this group as well. Just listen to to verse 32 in Romans 1, after Paul has listed all sorts of of sins, like murder, deceit, gossip, slander, boastfulness, heartlessness, just to, to name a few. Notice what he says in verse 32. He says, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. I mean, think about that statement in relation to Romans 9. Both Jacob and Esau are in the same boat. They are both sinners. They're both corrupt at their core. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and the list goes on and on and on. And God knows that the kind of guys that these two are going to be before they're ever born because he knows the curse. He knows that they are going to be inventors of evil and do the things for which they know they deserve to die. He knows that they're not only going to practice those things, but they're going to give approval to others who will do those things as well. Yet, before the child has been born, and before he's done any of this, God determined in his mercy that he would bestow his love on Jacob. The scandalous thing about Romans 9.13 is not so much the word hated here, as I will admit it does propose difficulty, But what is much more outrageous is that God actually loved Jacob. That God loves us. We believe, place our faith and and trust in Jesus Christ that God would take those who devise evil, devise objects to worship other than the one true God and love them more than God. Calvin says that The human heart is a factory of idols, and he's exactly correct. We not only exchange the worship of God for other things, but we actually invent things to worship besides God. And yet, we are told that we are loved by God. The scandalous thing in that verse is that Jacob was actually loved by God. The scandalous thing for each one of us this morning, if you believe, is that you can be loved by God. The word hated does pose a challenge. After all, we said at the start that it is the word hated here that, that piques our sense of justice, that there must, and there must be a reason for that. I would suggest that it's partly because we can only define hatred in terms of sin. We, we don't really have a, another category for hatred, especially when it comes to people. Hatred is always a, a sinful, wrong thing. And if our, like, for instance, if our child comes home from school, little Joey is his name. I don't think there's any little Joeys here. Came home from school one day and, and said, you know, there was this boy, he was, he was really mean to me today. He just did some evil things, and he went on to, to list the evil things that this little boy has, has done. And, and mom and dad are saying, well, did he, did he did this and this? And, and the little boy is, is telling them all of the evil things. He goes on, he got in trouble with the teacher. In fact, he got sent to the principal's office multiple times, and the principal said that he was the worst kid ever 
in kindergarten. And mom and dad were shocked that a principal could say such a thing about a child. And then all of a sudden, our little boy looks at us and says, and I hate that boy. I hate him. All of a sudden, all of the shock, all of the horror that we heard about what this little boy has done is gone, and our attention is turned to our own child. Isn't that the way it would be, parents? That all we just heard about this little boy is all but forgotten, and our own child is now being instructed that as we as Christ followers, we do not hate anyone. It doesn't matter what they do to us. We love them. And we might even throw in there, because that is what God does. Luckily, our child is in kindergarten in this illustration and will not know better to come back with, what about Romans 9.13? But the fact is, the Bible is, is so clear that we are to love our enemies. I mean, our instruction to our child is absolutely right. We are to model God's love for Jacob, not his hatred for Esau. But the statement poses difficulty. How are we to understand the word hated in Romans 9.13? And really, we could just add on to that question the statement in verse 18, which is very similar. So then he has mercy on whoever he has mercy, and whoever he wills, he hardens. How do we understand that statement? Of course, there Paul is referring back uh, to uh, speaking of Pharaoh in a quote from Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. So the, the question in all of this is, is God just? Is God just? This is the question in verse 14. What should we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. Of course, Paul answers the question in the negative. We should also be aware that Paul answers the question in the strongest terms possible, as forceful as he possibly can be. There is absolutely no injustice in God, is what he's saying. Now, the reason that Paul is asking this question is to remind us is because he has gone through these three generations of election, showing that, that God has chosen one, not the other. He chose Abraham, not anybody else from Ur. Chose Isaac, not Ishmael, Jacob, not Esau. And Paul anticipates the question that is natural, that is going to come on the lips of his readers, that, see, that just says that God seems to be very unjust on God's part. Of course, the doctrine of election isn't the only place we question God's justice. We look at our own situation in life and we think that if, if God would have just been just to us, and in given what he gives so many others in terms of education or opportunity, health, good looks. If we've gotten those things, we could have accomplished and done so much more. We can't question God's goodness and injustice when he lets somebody close to us die at an early age. We look at natural disasters or diseases like cancer and wonder why, would, why wouldn't God do anything about those when he could. There are times when we look at these things and on some level, we just question, is God just? But the Bible is emphatically clear. Deuteronomy 32.4 declares that all God's ways are just. The scriptures confirm not only does God act justly in all situations, that he actually is just. That is who he is. So God is just. There is no injustice in God. If there was, he wouldn't be God. Yet we read in Romans 9, Paul saying that God chooses one as a child of promise, but passes by another. And that the one is passed over, in this case Esau, is said to be hated by God. How do we grasp that? We've already noted that we don't have a category for godly hate. Our hate is always tainted 
it's, it's hard for us to conceive of, of anger that is not tainted by sin as well. So, our, so the statements in, in Scripture about God's anger towards sin are difficult for us to understand. And at this point, we must admit that we're unable to grasp the complexities of God. This is where we're, we're bumping up against some mysteries. We recognize that, that God abhors sin. God hates sin and is angry with sinners on account of their rebellion. I think there's, there's something there that we can grasp, although it's difficult for us. But for God to say that he hates an individual as he does here is really hard for us to grasp. I think at this point it's help for us, helpful for us to, to point to Luke chapter 14 and verse 26. Luke 14, 26. Here Jesus says that if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife, his child, his brothers and sisters, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Certainly, in that text, Jesus isn't advocating that we must hate our families before we can be his followers. That does not make sense in the light of all of the other love your enemies passages. What Jesus is doing here is using a liter literary device, and the emphasis needs to be placed on the, the love we have for Jesus. In fact, he's saying that the love that we have for Jesus should make all of our other loves in our lives look like hate in comparison to that. Jesus is making the point, if you are to be his disciple, you must love him before anything else. Now, whether that is possible is a question for another day. But for now, just notice the literary device and apply this back to the passage in Romans 9.13. What we would be saying there is that the love that God has for Jacob, he has in such a degree that his love for Esau or his relationship for Esau can only be described as hate in comparison. Certainly, there is a sense in which God loves everyone. He loves the world. He loves all of creation. But in the doctrine of election, and, and really what we've seen in, in Romans chapter 8, is we see this tremendous love that God has for His own children. Right? Chapter 8 starts by saying that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. In other words, for those who are loved by Christ. And it ends by saying that nothing could ever separate us from Christ's love. That's the love that he's talking about here. And that's the love that God has for Jacob. There's no condemnation for Jacob. There's nothing that could ever separate Jacob from Christ's love. And that love he does not have for Esau. And in light of that, the only way to describe God's feelings toward Esau is hate. Does that help? Maybe a little. Still difficult. I know there's tremendous mystery. It doesn't say all there needs to be said. Even if we try to create a category for the word hate like we've done here, and say that it's a literary device and use in comparison to love, it still doesn't seem quite right. At this point, we need to look at how Paul answers this question. Is God really just? Really, Paul goes on to what God says to Moses in Exodus 33, 19. It's quoted in verse 15. He says, God says to Moses, I will have mercy upon who I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on who I have compassion. Now, the, the first thing that we need to say here is something that I think is, is understood, or at least should be at this point in the book of Romans, and that is that all human beings deserve hell, not heaven. All human beings deserve hell, not heaven. Paul's argument throughout the book of Romans makes this clear, and we are not going to, to go back through the whole argument for the sake of time, but just Romans 3, where Paul says that there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who does good, no one who seeks God. The fact is, left on our own, we all deserve 
hell. We deserve the weight of God's wrath for our sin. Just as a murderer deserves to be condemned for his crimes, so does every single person that has lived and will live deserve for the sake of their sin, save Jesus Christ. I want you to notice something else about what we just said. We said that all human beings deserve. Notice the word uh, deserve here. It's important because first, we're not saying that every human being deserves that every human being that deserves hell ends up there. But also notice that the word deserve is a category of justice. When God gives to those what they deserve, that is justice. The interesting thing about how Paul answers this objection of God being unjust is to bring up another category, and that is mercy. God will show mercy on whom he has mercy. So secondly, if any person is to be saved, it must be because of mercy, which is in a different category than justice is. Justice speaks of what we deserve or what we should get based on our own merit. But mercy is in another category altogether. Mercy is to withhold from somebody what they deserve. So justice is all humanity getting what they deserve. Mercy is God withholding that punishment that is due us who deserve it. Do you see how those two things are in different categories? Let me just anticipate a question that some might have at this point, and that is, how can God then be just if everyone deserves hell, but he shows mercy to some? You see what I'm saying? Everyone deserves to pay for their crime, but he doesn't give that to everyone. To some, he shows mercy. How then can we say that God is just? This is the essence of the gospel. And it's something that is even coming under attack by, by some in our own denomination. Some will say, well, God just shows mercy because he is God, and he, and he can. God can do anything he wants. And if God wants to show mercy, he can show mercy. For no real reason. And if God shows mercy for no reason, then it actually calls his justice into question, doesn't it? God must show mercy and still be just. And justice for God is to render to each the penalty for their works. If you do the crime, you must do the, the time. In our world, you couldn't have a, a court case of a murderer who everyone knows committed the crime, who said he was not sorry for doing the crime, who has admitted to the crime. The jury has passed judgment, found him guilty. There's no question about his guilt, his deserving of the death penalty for the crime, but the judge, just for no reason, arbitrarily says, you are free to go. That might be mercy, but it also perverts justice. We cannot have this with God. If God is anything, He is just. So how can God be both just and save some from their sin at the same time? The answer to that is Jesus. Jesus came. He lived the perfect life. He kept the law at every point in which we have failed. In other words, Jesus deserves all of the blessings that would have been Adam's if Adam wouldn't have failed in the Garden of Eden. In other words, Jesus alone deserves to eat from the tree of life. And all the blessings that, that Adam and the rest of his progeny missed out on because of his sin. And it was on the, the cross that the innocent, the one who did not deserve to die for sin, paid the penalty that was due sinners. He was crucified, the innocent for the guilty, and the weight of God's wrath fell on his shoulders as he suffered on the cross for every sin that you and I have committed. You see, in faith, in, in belief, in, in trust in Jesus, that our sin was, was transferred to Jesus and his righteousness given to us. What is known as the, the glorious exchange, our sin for the righteousness of Christ. 
So how can God have mercy on whom he has mercy and still be just? The answer is that to those he shows mercy, their sin was dealt with justly on the cross. God is still just. Our crimes were still dealt with. God doesn't just dismiss them. He doesn't just toss them away as if they don't matter. Every sin that we have committed and will commit was laid on Christ, and He bore the weight of that for us. This is what we mean when we speak of substitutionary atonement. Our sin is transferred to Him and His righteousness given to us. Here's a third point coming back to some people's objection to the doctrine of election. But hear this carefully. James Boyce says it this way. He says, if God should save people on the basis of something in them, their, in their, their faith, their good works, some kind of merit, whatever, this would actually be injustice since people's backgrounds are so unequal. What he's saying here is that if God saves people on the basis of something he sees in them, in their goodness or whatever it might be, this would actually be injustice on God's part. And the reasoning he gives is because people are so unequal. Their lives are so unequal. They live in different places, in different families. And one of my biggest struggles for a long time was how God allowed me to be raised in a Christian home, hearing the gospel multiple times a week, and my friends across the street not hearing it hardly at all. They did not have the same opportunity. Of course, I came to realize that God put me across the street from my friends for a reason. That is, I had the gospel to share with them. But what about people in other countries, Muslim countries, places where religion is illegal? If God chooses on the basis of some good he's going to see in us, some merit we've achieved on ourselves, that would be not just. So the answer to Paul's question at the onset here, is God unjust? The answer is an equivocal no. And the reason that he gives is that God shows mercy to those he shows mercy. The other part is that the others then get exactly what they deserve. That's justice. God is just. He shows mercy to some and gives others justice. So then some might question and say, well, wait a minute. Well, shouldn't God then show mercy to everyone? Shouldn't God show mercy to everyone? We don't have a lot of time here, but just notice that this question is confusing categories. The word should or shouldn't is the, in the category of justice. Everyone should get right what they deserve. Should means ought or must. It's implying what God should do. What would be right for God to do? And we understand that what is right for God to do would be to give everyone what they deserve. His wrath poured out on sin. To say that God should show mercy is to confuse the category of mercy and justice. Mercy is not giving somebody what they deserve. To say that somebody deserves or should get not what they deserve to get doesn't make any sense. And it radically misunderstands the categories of justice and mercy of God. So Paul answers this question. God shows mercy to those He shows mercy to those He's predestined to believe in His Son, to have faith and trust in Him. It is to those He will show mercy. Is there tremendous mystery here? Absolutely. Is there a lot of questions that raise that just can't be answered? Perhaps. But one thing that we do know is that God is just. And that He is only just because Jesus Christ took on the cross the punishment that was reserved for you. God can show you mercy precisely because your debt was paid in full on the cross. If you would just believe and trust in Jesus Christ as your only hope. Let me just close 
with the first question of the, the Heidelberg Catechism. Heidelberg Catechism, uh, first question asks this, what is your only comfort in life and death? It's quite a question, isn't it? What is your only comfort in life and death? And the Heidelberg answers beautifully this way, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and death, to my faithful savior, faithful savior, Jesus Christ. He has paid for all of my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on, to live for him. God is the only hero in your story of redemption. And he is just. Let's pray.